ready to achieve great heights, then you're in the right place. Welcome to Power Your Performance, the podcast where we dive deep with leaders in the gaming world and beyond and learn the techniques they use to power their lives. I am your host, Gary Kleinman. Welcome, Jeannie Kulazakis, to Power Your Performance. Hello. Hello, nice hello, to be here. Hello. Thanks for having me, Gary. It is my pleasure to have you. It is my pleasure to pronounce your name properly, and I've been practicing <laughs> for a day and a half, so I, I appreciate that. Now, I, And now I don't have to bring it up again, so um, it's, a, it's a good day. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I got to tell you, I've been telling people in advance in, in my own circle of influence, the kind of people that are coming on and who's been on, and when I talk about ergonomics, uh, we're gonna, oh God, I got to hear about this. I just, I just have to hear about that because <laughs> I, I think there is so much pain and suffering going on. Forget gaming, we'll get into gaming, but just the pain and suffering um, with the overabundance of every kind of screen, of every kind of size. Um, and, and I think I had mentioned it to you if I didn't. Um, I now have you know a trigger thumb that just got an injection uh, we'll get another one um, in another week and a half. And, and I never in my wildest imagination thought that I would be running around with clicking in my fingers and thumbs from um, the way that I use devices. So welcome. Uh, we're going to get to that. But the first thing I love to do, I actually haven't done this in a while. What's the first concert you ever went to? Oh my God! The police. The police. There you go. It's great insight. You know, if you ever want, if you ever want to, you know, cut ice uh, on, on a meeting, you go around the table and you, you you say, "Hey, you know, what's the first concert?" I remember being in a meeting and somebody said Menudo, and 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 it was the general manager and his entire staff just busted up, right? Um, and I and I heard from him many, many, many months later. He goes, "You know what? You humanized me in front of my team." Faster than, and I looked at it and I said, Menudo? Really? I said, you couldn't have lied and come up with something else. But So it's the police, and, and that says a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> right? Long time ago. A long time ago. Um, yes. Yeah, but it's it's fun to ask. Uh, yeah. Ergonomics. What was yours? What was, My, was yours, mine? Gary? Elton John. Oh, Elton <laughs> John. I'm too. not going to give you the year. Um, <laughs> it was Elton John when he first came to the United States. Uh, oh, very nice. And it was very cool. Uh, it was very mm-hmm. cool then. So that 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 was a good one to start out with. And I think it's come all gone downhill from then in my, my choice of music but and especially if you ask my children they'll agree with that uh, <laughs> physiology is your passion in your life right how did physiology what, anatomy i mean i'm a physical therapist so yeah so where did that come from i mean where's that first start where were you and you go hey the body matters and i'm gonna be an expert in it so uh, my father was an orthopedic surgeon and so I grew up, you know, uh, licking, licking envelopes for his billing every month. My sisters answered the phones. You know, my mom did the, uh, <laughs> the accounting. Of course. <laughs> uh, slash medical <laughs> assisting. It was, uh, you know, it was the Partridge family, the medical edition. Oh, that's so cute. And, um, And, uh, you know, it was enough to turn me off to medicine because it was very, I mean, especially orthopedics, it's a, you know, it's a very brutal discipline. You know, he had to do rounds in the ER. So we used to see the trauma and I couldn't stomach the trauma. Um, And about 15 years into his practice. So, you know, when I was in high school, he and a couple of his fellow orthopedic surgeons opened up a PT clinic because they understood the importance of rehab. Not every, or not every surgeon refers their patients to physical therapy, which is a, which is criminal, uh, as far as I'm concerned, but my dad was very progressive wow. that way. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I started working there and then I, turned away from that as all kids do because it was too much parent, you know, my own rebellion. So I went to Purdue um, and I actually studied advertising at an engineering school. I was whimsical with my words. So I studied advertising, advertising copy, communications. And then when I, you know, finished that, I was, there was, there was just no enthusiasm. And when I, when I finished college, I, um, 
came back to Washington, D.C., which is, you know, northern Virginia, which is where I grew up and went right back into the clinic and thought, you know what, this doesn't suck. And this is a, you know, this isn't, I don't see the doom and gloom. I see them after they're sewn up. This clinic is full of music and happy people. And, you know, in lieu of the winning lottery ticket, if I have to work for the rest of my life, this is a lovely way to do it. Path. Yeah. And there will never be a bad time to know what this teaches you. So no, without I just, a doubt. listen, I've had six knee surgery, so I understand the, <laughs> uh, yeah. the value of, of, of PT and, yeah. um, and yeah. this, and this is not about me, but I'm not getting a knee replacement because I'm a baby. Um, <laughs> and, that, and that's just the way it is until I yeah. have to, I, I won't. Um, yeah. and, and so you start with the PT, right. And you, you go to school for that, mm-hmm. right. Um, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I went to school mm-hmm. for that. And uh, and then I moved to Chicago after my I finished PT school, uh, worked at the Cubby Bear as a bartender to pay off my, P- my school loans, but eventually made it back to PT about two years later. And uh, go Cubs. And um, great stadium. And yes. And uh, and started there. Uh, doing occupational health. So I was doing a PT for, you know, basically blue collar workers. And about 10 years into that, I came back, I, you know, got married, started a family and decided to come back to Washington, D.C. And the there, there are not a lot of blue collar workers, right? Bureaucracy has the word desk right in it. So I transitioned from blue collar workers to basically desk jockeys. And that was in about 2000 and maybe like 10, 11. Okay. And which was really when our behavior sociologically, just, you know, the first world nations really started taking to, you know, cell phones became affordable, you know, uh, handheld devices started to become affordable. Uh, you know, kids started getting electronics in schooling. So we started to see this mass spike in hours per daily use of electronics use right around the same time where I was, you know, treating in an outpatient urban environment, seeing, you know, seeing people who had injuries that they didn't understand, you know, why they were happening or why they were not healing. And eventually it came fully obvious to me that it had everything and everything to do with the way that they were interacting with gravity during electronics use and that there had to be a better way. And what I also learned at that time is that physical therapists don't do any of this research. No. Um, The people who do that research are environmental health and safety folks, uh, furniture companies, um, you know, because as a PT, I'm science driven, right? Everything I'm supposed to teach has to be evidence based. And actually, one of the epiphany moments that I had was it was my job to make uh, instruction pamphlets on how to adjust your car seat and also how to adjust your office chair. And what was striking to me was how different the sitting positions were for one versus the other. The sitting position, it's very much like a like a car seat. Your legs are extended. Your feet are on an angled platform. Your knees are in an open position, 120 degrees. Your hips are back. You're slightly reclined. You've got your head rest and, you know, your steering wheel is yep. placed in such a way that your shoulders, elbows, everything's relaxed. But yet in the office, it was this 90 degree upright and elbows at 90 degrees and knees at 90 degrees and everything in 90 degrees. And I thought, what's that about? How, you know, how is gravity different in a car seat than it is in an office chair? Well, it's fascinating. Because, I mean, who thinks about that? But yes, without a doubt. Right. So I started to really delve into that research. Why is one group telling us to sit like this for prolonged sitting? And the other one is telling us to sit like this for occupational sitting, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll call it. And, um, and so it comes to find out you know, uh, basically what I learned was that the correct way is the way that car seats and cockpits are designed to this day with the slight recline with the legs that are very particular legs and hips, you know, ankles, knees, hips, low back, everything oriented in a very specific way. It's still dynamic, but it's, it's still not upright, right? Um, right. It does need to be at a bit of a recline for 
intravertebral disc pressure reasons, right? So all. So, so the car seat, for the most part, is um, uh, correct. better. Is correct. Yes, is um, is more musculoskeletally efficient. It okay. decelerates compression related disorders. Uh, it, it, it significantly slows down spine compression related disorders. So, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, I used to be six foot one. Now, you know, now I'm five ten. Right. You know, you hear people talk about that's, how they shrink. That's my over excuse, time. but it happened at birth. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I can't I can't blame oh. it on my car seat, but that's okay. I'll blame on my parents. Oh uh, yeah. So. But you're saying the well, it's interesting because you mentioned the cockpit, right? Yeah. But the passenger seats in the planes are not. They're not either a car seat nor right. a cockpit. Uh, They're also not designed to be used for eight hours a day every day. So they are designed for making money, the right. spacing, the positioning is minimum comfort requirements um, for, you know, short durations. And that's that's the thing that you have to understand is that pain disorders, knee problems, thumb problems, all your computer use related, you know, spine and joint spine and joint degeneration issues, disorders stem from something we call your total exposure. Okay. That's the right. number one risk factor. How many hours a day are you interacting with monitors, whether it's in your hand, on your desktop, laptop, Kindle, whatever. Okay. Right. It's about your total exposure. So if your exposure is only two or three hours for a flight one to twice a month, then that's not really where your problem is. That's not where you need to focus your ergonomic, you know, uh, redesign efforts. You really need to focus your redesign efforts or your built environment redesign efforts and, and your behavioral efforts in the space in which you find yourself parked most of the time. So there are people that have a primary workspace, a secondary workspace, a tertiary. Right. So you have like the typical, you know, college graduate who, you know, comes out, they get a job, they're working at it eight hours a day, but at night they're pursuing their grad degree. So at, during the day they're in the office at night, they're at home on a laptop. So, you know, you really start to, at least in my practice, in my ergonomics consulting business, we really focus on, you know, if we, if the number one risk is total exposure, then let's hit that one spot in which you spend the most time so that it can forgive if you spend other time in less ergonomic conditions, because at least your primary is therapeutic. All right. So, you know, I'm going to jump ahead. And we're going to come back to kind of your chronology. But when you're just giving telling me that COVID then must have been a major intrusion in terms of people for years are going to work and they have an environment there that may be uh, scientifically designed and what have you. And now for two years is sitting at home uh, remote working in what would probably not be a, a, a better environment physiologically. And that's got to have impacted people for the two years into, you know, working out of their bed. Right. Uh, and I, I know a lot of people I go, yeah, I'm just my daughter being one of them said, yeah, we're on, we're on a call in bed right now. Right. Um, kind of thing. And mm -hmm. and that has to have then increased uh, pain and discomfort uh, for, during covid as a result of that. So, um, yes, I mean, in brief, of course. Right. right. So, I mean, to get a little bit more to hone in a little bit again speaking of total exposure right so if your total exposure to poopy ergonomic conditions becomes greater then the rate of degenerative conditions starts to accelerate because again you know low back pain chronic low back pain doesn't happen overnight neck pain right. your thumb problem it doesn't happen overnight they are they are degenerative slow moving icebergs right right um and and what we saw was that the rate of degenerative changes escalated so you know somebody who was hobbling along okay, tolerating a knee problem, tolerating a hip arthritis, um, all of a sudden uh, was incapable of tolerating any 
inefficiencies, any prolonged sitting because it was simply too painful. Right. Now, just because you have a nice chair, because to address the other part that you said, well, you know, at office, we have better ergonomic conditions, hogwash. So they might have better equipment, but they don't necessarily have better ergonomic conditions because best ergonomic conditions are the postures you assume and the movements that you partake in. It's, it's like brushing and flossing, right. right? So there's ideal ways to sit. There's ideal positioning as they position you in a car seat, as all car seats are designed for you to sit in a very specific way. Um, and then there's ideal movement patterns, which is every 30 minutes, you're supposed to activate the glutes for you know, for cardiovascular maintenance, right? Again, this is not, this is nothing to do with how active you are outside of your electronics use. This has nothing to do with your macro wellness, as I like to call it. This is about workplace hygiene. That's it. That's you know, it. just like we brush and floss to, to prevent tooth decay, we engage in ideal postures and movement patterns to prevent computer-based work-related spine and joint decay. That's it. Okay. It's, it's a seatbelt. Your other values don't matter here. No, and that, so, I appreciate that. Um, right. And then, and then somewhere, cause I, I don't want to skip over your, your, your history and your chronology. And, and then at some point you go to Yahoo, correct? Were you, you uh, AOL. AOL. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. It, yes. It, it, yes. Um, yes. It, that was it, and, alarming. And how did that come about? Because what you did there, I find fascinating. And then we'll segue into gaming and, and uh, the, the total workplace environment and what you right. manufacture and what have you. But, right. but let's talk about the AOL aspect. So um, in around 2015, uh, what we saw in companies was well, generally on the clinic side, because I was still in the clinic. I had never had a job since PT school outside of bartending, uh, outside of a PT clinic. And, uh, and I knew inside the PT clinic that there was a problem outside in this place called corporate America and the federal government, because I'm in Washington, D.C. So, again, you know, offices, right. the office space had a problem. And so, like many of my colleagues, we would write letters of recommendation for this patient needs a standing desk. This patient needs an ergonomic desk. You know, we were writing the dreaded letter that the HR person would receive and go, what? You know, hey, my back hurts. So I'm going to get this kid an ergonomic chair while I'm going to go get, you know, spine injections after work. You know, there was, you know. We're writing letters to HR professionals about, you know, ergonomic needs, which again, just stupid. Okay. Um, so, but AOL was a little more progressive and they had an environmental health and safety department and they had uh, contracted um, a specialist in ergonomics because they knew what they didn't know. That's what good companies do. They know what they don't know and they know. What and, you, and you fill the gap. No question. You fill the right. gap with people you that do fill the gap without a doubt. That's that's what right. good companies do. Right. So AOL. Um, so, uh, you know, I was writing these letters and I, and I knew at that time that I was like, you know, I just feel like there's a, there's a, there's a missing link. There's some synapse that's not firing between the people that take care of the health of these employees outside the office and the people who take care of the health inside the office. Like there's a missing link here. So I started looking for work and I was looking for, I knew that it had, I actually started looking for certification courses and for physical therapists. Like how does a, how does an, a physical therapist become certified in ergonomics? Like how does this work? And it turns out there's pretty much none. Um, there is one, it's a weekend course. I did take it. That's crazy. Um, but there is no real certification. And then if you look globally at OSHA's requirements for ergonomic certifications, you also find out there's no governance on this. If you want to call yourself an ergonomist, you, you can. can do that. You can do that. Oh, I might okay, just do that. I might start doing that on Monday. <laughs> Yeah, good. Right. Okay. I need Very a new good. certification and a degree, List. so I it, think I'm going to do that. Uh, it I, works. I, I appreciate the permission to allow me to do that starting on Monday. Uh, There's <laughs> no one that can stop you. Okay. Uh, um, but uh, but uh, and I found a lady who um, 
who had a company and she was looking for subcontractors. And, uh, and so I filed for this position and what it was, was it was my job to go in there and, um, they were having AOL was having a very specific problem for years that they had, or for the, you know, from 2010 when standing desk sort of came to be right. and 2015, the policy was you had to have a letter from a doctor saying that you needed this thing. Well, in 2015 ish, a company called Veridesk came about with this thing that you sit on top of a desk that goes up and down, that black thing that goes up right. and down. And it's, you know, $500 versus the $3,000 that standing desks used to cost back then. And so, so many of these young kids and folks were asking for them that they finally said, you know what? We don't need letters from doctors. Just, we'll just it's do it. so inexpensive. We'll just let you have it. So the policy became no more letters from doctors, which was, of course, a decision driven by HR, who no longer wanted to receive those letters. And about six months later, people started wanting them off their desks. They were like, never mind. I don't like this. It's now in the way. And so they started getting letters again from doctors for more ornate ergonomic things. And AOL was like, wait a minute, what, what is the right answer here? We don't even know what to do. So it was my job to go to AOL and figure out what the problem was with these things called converter solutions. And could we fix it somehow so that they still didn't need to get letters from doctors? And so that's what I did there. I, I basically analyzed, I did two things there. I analyzed the problem. I figured out what the problem was with these standing desk, you know, converter solutions. This was around the same time when sitting's the new smoking, right? And everybody was like, oh, everybody, the way, the way you fix sitting is you simply get rid of the chair, duh. Um, and, and listen, I was on that bandwagon. I was right up there thinking, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Until I started to understand what the long term, again, these are slow cooked, slow baked degenerative conditions. They don't happen overnight. And so the consequences of the standing of the converter solutions about it took about six months, six to eight months, depending on how active the employee was um, with the desk to really see what the long term mm. consequences of the use of that device was. OK, right. So, and yeah, yeah, no, no, I mean, it's fascinating. In the time we have left, I, I do want to take all that history and depth of experience and education and apply it to gaming. I mean, the one thing mm -hmm. is running skins.gg, uh, you know, we have supplements to address some of these things. The, the anxiety, which is some of that is related to your physical condition, certainly the pain. Uh, back, shoulders, neck, arms, hands, fingers, thumb. I mean, it, it's all over the place, and it's great that there are companies like Skins uh, that address that with, with supplements. But what specifically are you recommending for gamers to do on, on two fronts? One of which, if they have an unlimited budget, they can obviously create an incredible, wonderful environment. And if they don't, what do they do? So I will, I will preface this by saying this, and I've said this already, gravity doesn't care what you're doing, whether you're gaming, writing a term paper, it doesn't care. If you are interacting with electronics, the hygiene, the, 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 the hygiene best practices is the same. Ideal postures, ideal movement patterns. Okay. Again, Work-life balance, not included. Values, not included. So with gaming, obviously, and we don't have to go into this, you know, uh, because it, even though the average gamer now is, you know, in their 30s or whatever else, that's still right. pretty young. And remember that even a 30-year-old, 30 years old, is what we consider the youngest digital native. So this is a cohort of human beings that have had handheld devices in their hands since birth. OK, no, no question. everyone over 30 has a complete can't really empathize with that musculoskeletal uprearing. It's like it's like a it's like a bonsai tree. We all had some sort of, you know, stick and rope around us and they've had none. 
Okay. And when they're young, it's not really consequential. But as they get to 30 and 40. Well, there's no question. I mean, you said the average age of a gamer is 37 and it is split right. almost equally uh, 50, 50 men and women. Uh, right. So, I mean, so do you look at that today and say the 16, 17, 18 year old um, extended gamer has a, a different um, education that needs to be imparted to them versus the 37 year old who's having general life degeneration um and and where where do they find the messaging for proper posture uh proper hand positioning leg positioning is that information even readily available and if not why not the reason why not is because of conflicting financial interests Right. So um, the reason why is because right now gaming is done in furniture, desks and chairs. Right. Right. And there are competing corporate interests in selling those desks and chairs. And so if you are an outside party who comes in and says, hey, that desk and chair is not the best built environment for that particular person, um, there is evidence that shows that people sitting in your desks and chairs actually have toxic postures and movement patterns. They're not going to broadcast that. And, you know, there's so much misinformation and so much gadgetry and so much snake oil salesmanship that goes on around this discussion. I mean, you, right? I mean, you talk about how you have supplements, and whatever else. I mean, what a loud space to have to compete, right? There's so many people who have you no. Know, oh, there's no question. Thing, it's a cluttered right? market. It's a cluttered market. And, 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 and the and, audience. Um is uneducated so right you know the we, we we go through this all the time on messaging it we spend a lot of time in education more than we do on almost anything else and especially the younger gamer is um invincible in their own mind right so they're they're not real apt to raise their hand and say oh my god i'm not as flexible as i thought i was but i'm whatever i'm going to take with nothing maybe an aspirin uh, the, the the older folks are saying hey you know life has worn me down in addition to my my chair and my desk and and, and my mouse and what have you so in an uneducated environment and yeah. and this is hopefully what we can impart with the time that we do have left is on a minimal basis what can uh gamers do at any age to improve uh, or zero out the negative effects of gravity. And on a higher level, um, what can they do to improve their workspace, um, get a better chair, and what's that range in between? So um, this is this discussion is very akin to teaching children about brushing and flossing. I always tell people, if you make it to the sink twice a day with a $5 toothbrush, it's you, you will have better teeth in the long run than somebody with a $300 toothbrush who never makes it to the sink. So it's not about, so I Good disagree point. that it is about how much you spend. It's about um, definitely having a minimum viable a workstation, which I will describe here in a second. Okay. And again, engaging in what we call ideal postures and patterns and um, creating an environment that is conducive to optimizing those two conditions. So, uh, so, so at, at the very least, at the very least, um, a decent chair, and it should be called an ergonomic task chair. So people who are searching need to find an ergonomic task chair. And if they are outliers, the, the, the sizing of that chair matters. So if they are four foot eight, then it's going to be a different chair than somebody who's six foot two. So you also have to look for those sort of outliers. So just as some people have triple A feet or triple E wide, you know, there are, you know, the size of the chair being uh so a chair is not a chair i mean a chair if a chair is not a chair is a chair it it does need to conform 
to it who needs you to are. Conform to the size because the location of the lumbar support and the location of the head support, just like the sh- just like the orthotic in your shoe has to have the curve in the correct space for the arch, and that's mm-hmm. based on your shoe size. The location of the lumbar support and the location of the cervical support is contingent on how tall that torso is. So chairs are made based on you know uh, on those measurements. Now most chairs are made to fit you know at, they aim for eighty percent of the population, and the outliers are screwed. Right. Yep, right. But then there's the, you know, then there's the hokas and the new balance of the industry that makes, you know, correctly sized chairs based on the height of the person. And my personal favorite, of course, is the Herman Miller Aeron um, because it comes in three sizes. Uh, it was designed pre NAFTA. And so they, you know, they were more concerned with the ergonomics and less about manufacturing costs. So that's why a lot of their chairs, uh, that particular company, Herman Miller, but, you know, the, the person who was running that company at that time and the and the people who are running it now, which are more marketing experts, not ergonomics experts, the way they used to be, they, you know, they they are running on the brand, right? They're running on fumes when it comes to that, but they're pretty good fumes because the chairs were built and designed in an, in a timeless fashion because the human being hasn't changed very much since the 1980s and 90s when those chairs were developed. Um, I, you know, they have some competitors, steel case and whatever else, but really that is the, you yeah. know, Tesla of office chairs. Right. Um, and if you fit the rest of the workstation around it correctly, then you're really looking at a piece uh, at, at a workstation or at least a chair that can last you a good two decades um, if you take care of it and whatever else, just like a car, right? right. Um, Which then becomes an investment and not a purchase. It does become an investment. But at the other at the other end, so if you're a parent who's like, well, I don't have, you know, $800 to spend on an office chair for my kid, then the other option is to get less you know, like, te- like shoes for your kids. Okay. You're going to get them at Walmart, but be prepared to buy one every year. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're going to have to buy them uh, with greater frequency and same thing, you know, uh, kids office chairs is a totally different discussion. And because I have an 11 and a seven year old, so this is a particularly, you know, that, that could be its own discussion. All right. You know, so it's keep, a great uh, idea. And I'm going to take yeah. you, I'm going to take you up on that. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and, su- and the and pandemic suited, yes. was the pandemic was nothing but an R&D fest in here. So, um, you know, we really we, and w- the way that they are set up now is absolutely the best. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you got to remember orthopedics means correction of the child. That's what orthopedics means. Oh, just really, that's the, so funny. Right. So the, the sooner that you get the you know, the stick and the rope around their growing trunks, um, then the better, the more fruitful, the less stress they will be in. You know, you're, you you talk a lot about stress and pain and you're absolutely right. And that is my wheelhouse, right? Every, everything that we do in the clinic, everything that we do for gamers, everything that we do for workers, people interacting with electronics, our success of ergonomic interventions is judged by a change in Pain levels. That's how we measure our success at my company, Ergo RX. Well, but that's, that's how. That, but that's at. how life is judged, right? right? Most people don't change behavior until the pain is so great right. that you change because right. you want to get yeah. rid of the pain, and that's true in relationships, physical, physical, emotionally, and everything else. So, yeah, pain is a driving force. In in pain in, is a driving force, unless you're talking about. Brushing and flossing, which is very interestingly taught to children at two years old, because yes. enough pain happened in their predecessors for them to understand the value of prevention. And or the earlier, the better, the intervention, the education, the training. The problem is we have not gotten there yet with children and uh, with ergonomics, because the 30-year-olds of today, the 37-year-olds have yet to become 80. Once they become 80 and they personally understand and can empathize finally with the consequences of what happens due to poor hygiene habits at a younger age, it's not going to become 
main main focus. Right now, what I have in my ha- wheelhouse, the people that I treat, the people that come to me seeking solutions for their children's gaming and whatever else are what we call early adapters. People who are smart enough to understand that this matters, that they don't have to, you don't have to wait until you have a mouthful of cavities and whatever right, to, to right. understand the value of prevention. So, you know, that's the, that's the issue right now. But if there's anything I can impart, I would say ideal postures, which is basically replicating what you see in, um, in car seat design. I mean, if you look up, you know, car seat design, human factors and images, you will see a person in a slight recline with a very specific, you know, oh yeah, that's how I sit in the car. Right. Um, and that's really what you want to replicate in terms of positioning. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, one of the things that happened from AOL was I, developed proprietary equipment that we later on had tested at Cornell University to prove that it was both healthy in terms of postures and movement patterns. And it was found to be an incredibly hygienic design. It's, you know, we use it to, we use it to optimize positioning in whatever office chair and desk that you have. We teach people how to position their hands, their feet, their monitors, their desks, if they have them, you don't necessarily have to have a desk. Not everybody games, you know, in a desk if you have handheld right. equipment, stuff right. like that. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's like, you know, trying to describe how you custom fit a suit. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, without pictures, it's hard to, without the person in front of you to sort of explain that process. But there is a customization, customized sort of like fitting yourself, just like when you get into a car rental, a rental car, the first you, thing you do you is you adjust it. the seat, right. you adjust the, the recline angle, you adjust the mirrors, you adjust the, you know, the steering wheel. The same needs to happen in your workstation. And a lot of people don't even know well enough to do that or how to do it. Right. Or what should the goal be? How do I know if it's right? I will tell you, here's the secret. Comfort is your guide. That's it. That's if it's it. comfortable to you, it's probably going to be okay. It's correct. Right. Exactly. That's, you know, discomfort leads to pain. So if you are in an, if you are in a state of the absence of discomfort, then you're not going to get to pain. There. So the thing that triggers changes in positions when you are gaming is pain. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be something else. Uh, you know, understanding that every 30 minutes you do have to engage the glutes, but there are ways of engaging the glutes. Like I will show you how I engage the glutes while sitting in a chair. So you disengage, you elevate, you increase the space between the vertebrae. I mean, again, it's a minimal decompression maneuver, but it's better than nothing. Than nothing, right? without, a, without a doubt. Without um, a doubt. So there are things that you can do, and uh, but the, you know, I'm twisting in the chair right now. I'm articulating my feet. I'm you know swinging. I'm not static, but I'm also not forward leaning and looking down into my laptop. So there are there best things. practices for movement as well as posture. Jeannie, thank you so much. Incredibly yes. informative. Uh, I'm sure everyone's going to take away notes and go, I got to start doing this, but I'm going to take you up. I think it's fascinating to do another session for the kids, right? Yes. And, and parents as gatekeepers to understand how to put good practices in as early as possible. As early as possible. That's right. Thank you so much for your time. We will You're be welcome. in touch and uh, sit healthy. <laughs> and move often <laughs> and move often thanks Jeannie bye bye thank bye-bye, you honey. thanks for listening this podcast is part of the MAP Esports Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises please be sure to leave us a review and follow us on your favorite podcast player